welcome everyone. I'm Gordon Masterton. I'm the master of the Worshipful Company of Engineers and also chair of future infrastructure at the University of Edinburgh and deputy convener of UCRIC. Now, UCRIC uh, stands for the UK Collaboratorium for Research in Infrastructure in Cities. And that's an EPSRC funded network of 15 universities now operating effectively as a geographically dispersed national institute for research and infrastructure in cities. And tonight's event is a collaboration between the Worshipful Company of Engineers and UCRIC. The company has been running a series of seminars on net zero carbon issues with the intention of raising the, the profile, not just within the company, but also in the wider livery movement and the square mile the City of London. Uh, we've had events in the past year, for example, on the battery challenge, on net zero carbon implications for energy, and on the financing and engineering of space. Uh, that's uh, space, the final frontier, not living and working space. Two weeks ago, we, we supported Alderman Alison Gowman's initiative, convening over 50 delivery companies to discuss what each of us might do to contribute to the City of London Corporation's Climate Action Strategy, which has been published. And tonight's event has got the same focus on, on net zero carbon, uh, but this time through the particular lens of infrastructure. What needs to change, how we might do it, but more importantly, the recognition that deciding what to do is, is not a simple issue. Infrastructure is a, is a complex system of systems. And to allow us to make no regret or even low regret decisions, we need to understand the interdependencies and the consequences in advance. So the topic we'll be exploring tonight is a systems perspective on net zero infrastructure. And to introduce the discussion, I'm delighted to, to welcome Dr. Anna Miich, of Imperial College London. Anna is co-director of the Centre for Systems Engineering and Innovation and a specialist in systems water management. And Imperial College is, of course, one of the 15 collaborating universities in UCRIC. After Anna's talk, she will hand over to Professor Jennifer White, also Imperial College, who's the Royal Academy of Engineering Langer Rook Chair in Systems Integration. And Jennifer, We'll then chair a panel discussion of four really distinguished experts to be introduced later uh, individually. And Anna, of course, will also join that panel. After that, the, the Zoom room will be open to questions from the audience. And you can either use the, the chat, and I hope that you do put some questions into the chat room in advance as they occur to you during the presentations and the panel discussion or raise your Zoom hand during the Q&A session. And we will do our best to bring in as many of the questions as we possibly can, but we will close at 7.15 p.m. promptly. So Anna, may I now hand on to you for your introductory presentation. Yeah, many thanks, Gordon. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really a huge pleasure to, to be here and to speak with you. So, as Gordon said, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, but also co-director of the Center for Systems and Engineering and Innovation at Imperial. And uh, within the next maybe 10 minutes or so, I'm, I'm just going to set the scene around the discussion that we uh, will have this evening, really focusing on two aspects. So one is systems aspect, and one is what we mean by, or what we could mean by net zero infrastructure. So to set the uh, scene, I thought mentioning um, uh, how we talk about the net zero carbon, I have chosen this slide just to capture the definition uh, by which is set by UK government, of course, 2050 net zero target and definition of that, which does include offsetting greenhouse gases emissions with different technologies like carbon capture and storage, but also some more environmental solutions. And then maybe just to put things into perspective, um, I also thought it's interesting to see 
at the more scientific uh, definition of the net zero carbon. And I do like this paper published by Yuri Rogel and his co-authors in 2015. And here you see that they have put a bit more detailed definition around the net zero carbon. So they look at the direct emissions, different technologies, so like CCS, but they also look at the impact around the contributions of the, of the land use, both in the form of emissions, but also as a way of removing the impact. And then basically balancing all of these elements will give us the, the net zero. Then we can uh, have a look and see what we mean by net zero, I guess, starting with carbon infrastructure. In And the things there, um, uh, at least from uh, one perspective, could say, well, we know a lot what is happening. So this is the graph around the UK emissions by sector published in 2018 by BASE. So we see the usual suspects, isn't it, here um, on the pollution emissions with heating in buildings, for example, in industry uh, being responsible for more than 30% of the emissions. And also what we have available for us are the options that we may use to deal with those emissions. So um, the good, for example, interesting report is the report published in 2019 by the Committee on Climate Justice, it's just one of many. Uh, why I have chosen it? Because it does give an overview of the range of options available for us uh, put together in a climate CO2 emissions, net zero emission scenarios. But interestingly here, and I think we are opening discussion now around the systems approach. So you, you see infrastructure here at the very uh, end and, and some information there, but you also see things that we would, or we could uh, link with infrastructure such as road transport, building, energy, even you know agriculture, the land use being at least possibly separate from, from the idea around uh, net zero infrastructure. So how we, what we, can we do about that? So maybe um, we can just step back and, and go back to fundamental or definitions around the infrastructure and how we want to see the infrastructure uh, going forward, how we think about the sustainable development and infrastructure. And this is an interesting report that has been published last year uh, around the flourishing systems. And the, the, they pose the idea, which, which you can see here, where the purpose of infrastructure uh, is human flourishing. So very much human centered view of the infrastructure um, and what Gordon has mentioned infrastructure as a system of systems. So kind of emphasizing the complexity of the, the problem we are trying to solve. But then interestingly, they also introduce the view around the life cycle of an infrastructure. So you see the construction part and then focus on the operation and, and use which I will mention in, uh, in this uh, introductory presentation. And then, of course, the way how we see it, how we think about the system will define the way how, how we manage. And I think we could explore that topic tonight. And here I'm going to offer you uh, maybe slightly alternative way of, of seeing the, the system. We have done, we, as I say, we, um, as a Center for Systems Engineering, we had the celebration, 10 year celebration event last year. Uh, and leading to the event, we have done a lot of discussion around uh, our future vision, which resulted in, in this paper, which you can have a look. Uh, it's it's uh, an open source publication where we summarize lots of our thinking. But um, among that, we have been really looking how we think about the net zero from the perspective of infrastructure. And this is the, this is the diagram that we have created. And here you see our city as a central part of that diagram. But we propose three key differences from, from, from the previous slide. So the first one is really the boundary at which we look at the problem of emissions and pollution. So the link between the cities and the environment and expanding the notion of the role of the infrastructure, not only for people, but also managing the, the ecology. The second element is really trying to see what is the ultimate goal of the carbon or pollution management, because we have two things. We have human activities that actually cause the pollution, but we also know that pollution doesn't always result in a damage. However, the damage is the impact, which either has the impact on human health or people, or has the impact on environment and the ecology. And the last element is this, is this uh, backward arrow is the notion that 
pollution maybe we have direct pollution but also we have the indirect pollution that is linked to the pressures and the resources which we take from the environment and which support the functioning of of our cities so with all that in mind we look at the system from its wider boundary so so wider environment uh, and link with the damage so beyond cities we also propose that we have a discussion beyond carbon and i think it would be really interesting to see where we end up today uh, i guess the question from my or from our perspective is are we missing the opportunity for sustainable development if we focus on carbon only and the, the last one is really the very broadest view on the uh, indirect pollution uh, looking at the materials and other resources so why we why we think this is this is all uh, important because if we have this visualization in mind then we can play around with the definitions because definitions do in influence a lot the way how we think about the problem and also how we think about solving the problem so if we start uh, unpacking the, the term so now i have used pollution here as so carbon is one form of pollution we can start thinking about the zero pollution infrastructure so this is probably the most ambitious uh, target. So we want to eliminate as much as possible pollution from the natural environment. So we are cutting, we are cutting the link here. And we do have options. So we, as, as you've seen in the diagram, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this, that there are low carbon options. We are using, and we will probably use more and more green infrastructure. We have technology for recycling and reuse. So all of that would keep the the system on this side isn't it without causing the pollution however something that comes back to systems you and thinking about the unintended consequences is the question around if we are if you're sorting this part what is happening upstream in the system so what is happening at the high level in the systems particularly from the perspective of the demand and the system use from the perspective of infrastructure operation, from the perspective of land development, and all the decisions that we make, which are not, at least at the moment, driven by environmental state, but more with our quality of life and, and, and the behavior. The, the second uh, interesting thing we can also discuss is the net zero concept. So if we have this diagram again, we can visualize it very nicely. So we have the uh, emissions which cause the pollution, but then we, we, we allow for that, but then we offset, isn't it? So, so we keep this, this loop um, functioning. Um, what is also maybe interesting and something we can discuss is around the notion of how we offset. So the, the net zero carbon uh, says we can offset in different places in different time because the effect is a global effect. So carbon capture and storage uh, has that function. Um, natural restoration also has that function. Technological options such as water and wastewater also, also have that function of creating pollution and then removing it. But again, there is however. <laughs> however, is, is that the second part here. So this, the, the problem with uh, dealing with the pollution in situations where we, for example, have a diffuse pollution. So we have pollution coming into uh, our water courses, which we do clean somewhere downstream, but there is a damage that is happening in between the point of pollution um, impact to the point of the where we take it out. And similar, uh, similar issues with air pollution. So if we remove the carbon from one location, that does contribute to the uh, global balance. But again, air pollution is a local effect. So how, how we go about that and what is the consequences on health as a form of damage. And then the last one is really interesting. Um, and there is a, it's a very no, well-known problem around the burden shifting. So we could do lots of things here uh, in the UK, but if we don't change our behavior and we still cons consume as much as we do, we are just putting that burden to some other system and someone else needs to um, deal for our um, basically pressures we put. So uh, with all that in mind, where I would like to end this introduction um, is with few things we, we do at Imperial. And again, they are explained in a bit more detail in, in the paper that I have mentioned. Of course, we are arguing for the systems level solutions. It's the theme for, for the evening. 
but I think in particular three aspects of that which we would propose. So the first one is around the evaluation. So how we evaluate the, the carbon emissions, how we evaluate the impact of different solutions will make a key difference of what is cost beneficial. Okay, part of the work we do here, and this is work done by Dr. Rupert Myers from our material section, is around the alternative materials uh, for which he is using life cycle analysis to really show the value of those materials. And I'm sure we'll be discussing materials at least a bit in, in the discussion tonight. And the second one is the around the operation. So if you remember the, the image around the infrastructure and the life cycle view, the operation and the use um, is a big part of the footprint, both in carbon, but also, also other pollution. So one way of trying to deal with that is to think about the operation in different ways and try to optimize the operation so that we have the uh, positive impact on the environment. So the example that uh, I have here is the, the work done in our transport section is done the work done by Dr. Mark Stettler and his team where he looked at the different altitudes of flying and how with um, not increasing the uh, emissions because of the changing of the pathways, uh, we can minimize or, or have the positive impact on the climate change uh, or reduction of the climate impact due, due to contrails. So kind of really thinking about the system and how environment and operation links, um, I think will be crucial for finding solutions. And then the last one is around integration. And this is the work that we have done in the environmental and water resources engineering section, uh, looking at the link between the water obstruction system, but then water discharge system. And the one reason why we could do that is because we, we have the integrated model that can do that. So if we can see the system as a whole, then we can play around with different operational options again, uh, which in this case uh, is the example of reducing obstructions upstream during high precipitation and leaving the water in the water course to help the environment dealing with pollution. Because the more water we have in the rivers, the, the more dilution it can, it can um, have and the pollution impacts would be less. Why is that important? Is that in, in this way, we are using environment as our infrastructure and the equivalent, which would need to be managed by built infrastructure could cost millions and millions of pounds. So this is all from me, uh, Jennifer. I would stop here. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, I think there's a sort of virtual round of applause that, that, that we kind of um, will we'll give you silently, perhaps. But um, I can see people are, are, are kind of uh, are showing their appreciation, which is nice. And I think that really sets up the evening very nicely in, 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 um, in giving us some things to think about around a systems perspective on net zero infrastructure. So I'm Jennifer White. I'm a co-director with Anna at the Centre for Systems Engineering and Innovation at Imperial College. Um, but really, my, my role is to... Um, to invite the, the distinguished panel that we've, we have um, here to first introduce themselves and then for us to get a little bit into the, in, to the discussion of the topic. And so um, I'm going to hand over very quickly to um, Daniel Johns, um, who's the Head of Public Affairs at Anglian Water. And just um, uh, if you could take a minute or two just to say who you are and, and how you, um, how, what perspective you bring to this topic um, for us this evening. Yeah, very, very glad to. Thanks very much. Uh, and it's great to be able to take part in this event tonight. So yes, you say I'm Daniel Johns. I'm Head of Public Affairs at Anglian Water. I guess my interest in this topic goes back some some period because about 10 years ago, I worked at DEFRA and been working in various policy roles at DEFRA. And I used to be in charge of the investment in flood defences around the country. Uh, and obviously that's quite topical at the moment with Storm Christoph and the real impacts we're seeing, not just in the east of England, but in Manchester and other parts of the country uh, with the really severe wet weather that we've had since Christmas. Um, just to kind of explain Anglia Water in our region, it's the largest water company region in England and Wales. It stretches all the way up from the Thames Estuary in the south to the Humber Estuary in the north. It stretches all the way out to east to Lowestoft, the most easily point in, in the UK, to Leicester in the west. So a really big region. It's the flattest part of the country. It's the driest part of the country, two thirds of average annual rainfall. And much of it is below sea level. 
So as you can imagine, climate change, not, not just in terms of reducing our emissions to net zero, but also making sure our infrastructure is resilient to climate change, droughts, flooding, uh, impacts on nature, and so forth is very much kind of center of the water company agenda. I just want to kind of, first of all, kind of recognize that water companies absolutely see themselves, ourselves as central to both the, the climate change and nature crisis, uh, as well as the societal change, uh, societal kind of uh, challenges that we face, you know, the leveling up agenda, social inequality, vulnerable customers, aging population. And we came together as an industry across the UK to kind of reaffirm our public interest, the public interest, interest commitment that uh, we launched in 2019. And central to that commitment was two main things. First of all, you know, as a company, Anglian Water has actually now changed its articles association. It's changed the very kind of fabric, uh, its constitution to enshrine a social and environmental purpose, which means that our, our directors, our board has now has duties to consider not just the kind of financial consequences of the decisions they take, but about delivering positive social and environmental objectives about considering not just our owners, but also our customers, our employees, our supply chain in those decisions. And we're actually applying now what we call a kind of six capitals decision-making framework to the investment choices that we make. So again, we're not just focused on the costs and benefits, but we're thinking about how this builds or detracts from natural capital, how it builds social capital, intellectual capital, uh, manufactured capital, and so forth. And we've already found that by thinking just about carbon as well as cost over the last 10 years, we've managed to reduce the carbon footprint of our capital programme by more than 60% alongside reducing our operational emissions by more than 30%. And by focusing on carbon, we're actually not building as much as we used to. We're not using as much concrete as steel. We're not using as much chemicals. And that means we've been able to reduce our costs of our capital programme by, by about 20% as well as the 60% redu reduction in the uh, carbon footprint. I think it's also uh, worthwhile recognizing that um, we're doing more and more these days, thinking not just about kind of end of pipe solutions, but about how we can work with nature, uh, including through kind of catchment based approaches so that we are uh, addressing problems at their source rather than dealing with the consequences downstream. Uh, we've built the first uh, treatment wetland in the country, which is just outside uh, Inglesthorpe in West Norfolk. And this is a series of gravity fed lagoons, which uses reed beds and other vegetation to naturally treat wastewater before it goes back into the environment. And ordinarily, we might have built concrete storage tanks, again, used chemical dosing to make sure we, was, we were meeting those strict environmental criteria with that wastewater. But instead, it just uses gravity. There's no energy use whatsoever. And of course, it's a fantastic kind of asset, both uh, for the local community uh, and for, for nature. And we've just been given 300 billion pounds worth of additional investment well, to accelerate those schemes uh, so that we can build another 34 such treatment wetlands across, uh, across our region. So I think you know, if I were to leave one thing with you, just as part of this opening kind of salvo space to get the discussion going, we, don't, we no longer really see ourselves just as a water company. It doesn't really describe us anymore. Uh, we produced 130 gigawatt hours of clean renewable electricity last year. We could become a net exporter of clean, clean energy by the end of the decade. We'll, of course, be running all of our vehicles, either as EVs or potentially using hydrogen or biogas uh, within our tankers and HGVs. Uh, we'll be using natural capital solutions, working with catchments rather than thinking about chemical steel and concrete uh, end of pipe. And we'll be fulfilling what we see as our purpose as a water company if we're delivering positive environmental and social objectives for the communities that we serve. Thanks very much. Thanks, Daniel. It's a great introduction. So, 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 David, can I hand over um, to to you? So, so, just to David Pinder. So, 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 I think also uh, just to talk about your role as leading net zero carbon uh, for the Construction Leadership Council and so on. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, if I may, I'd like to start by just saying a few words about uh, Mixergy. So I'm also chair of Mixergy as well as uh, chairing the Green Construction Board. Um, it's, uh, you won't have heard of us. We're a clean uh, tech startup company uh, spun out of Oxford University. But we've got some really interesting technology that uh, improves the efficiency of water heating, which sounds pretty mundane but we've got 10 million cylinders already installed across, not we haven't, uh, the, uh, the estate of cylinders across the UK is 10 million just in homes. And uh, we've got technology that will improve the um, 
uh, the energy efficiency of those tanks, but also can connect them in the internet of tanks so that we've got the capability of producing a huge demand side response capability and uh, facilitate the um, grid balancing, which will become more and more important, of course, as we move across to renewables. So that's what little Mixergy gets up to. My background is uh, I, I grew up in manufacturing. I've been um, producing uh, construction products for the last 35 years, uh, initially at Pilkid and Glass, and then later uh, running Baxi, Baxi Heating in the UK. In Baxi, we were uh, and still are very much at the fore of um, producing the first hydrogen boilers. So um, as an alternative heating system to heat pumps, uh, which Baxi Heating also supply through their um, parent company, BDR Thermaya. So that's my background. Oh, I'm not an engineer, by the way. I'm from the dark side. I'm a marketeer. So uh, apologies straight away. I'm, uh, um, yeah, uh, probably the only non-engineer here, I guess. But anyway, um, that, that means that my, no, that means my focus is slightly different, perhaps, to others. Um, my, my other role is um, in leading the Green Construction Board, which is the net zero or sustainability arm of the Construction Leadership Council. So our objective really is to um, accelerate uh, the pathway to net zero for the construction sector. Um, and we do that by trying to influence government policy. That's uh, the principal thing that we do. Uh, we do thought leadership pieces and we consult with um, all the different guises of bays. I think they've counted five so far that uh, bays represent themselves uh, as, uh, along with um, DEFRA and MHCLG. So, yeah, talking to government about things like future home standard, heat and building strategy, and uh, trying to accelerate the delivery of net zero through policy. We also have a role to play in uh, corralling industry through the CLC. And I'm one of eight uh, industry initiatives that the CLC has running alongside other things like uh, modern methods of construction, safety, uh, and so on. And we deliver those through uh, four uh, work streams that are sectorally based, one of which is uh, infrastructure. Congratulations to um, uh, the uh, City of London Corporation for having so much ambition around its uh, net zero targets. Absolutely fantastic that you've uh, chosen to go for 2027 for um, uh, your own operations and 2040 uh, looking beyond the supply chain and uh, uh, areas of investment. So. Uh, really uh, excellent uh, leadership being shown there. Um, in terms of, I mentioned already, I'm a marketeer, so my interest really is on the outcomes and the end users um, and, and listening to the voice of the customer and understanding the impact we have on people and communities and trying to link that back to achieving you know, the grand schemes of delivering the sixth carbon budget. So that's really where I'm coming from. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, Mary, can I hand over to you? So, Professor Mary Ryan. Uh... Thanks, Jennifer. I bet, yeah, thanks, everyone. It's, it's shaping up to be a very interesting evening. I have to say, I was going to just admit to being a slight, feeling like a slight interloper talking about infrastructure, but um, I, think, I think David's outbid me by saying he's not even an engineer. So, so I'm Mary Ryan. I'm a professor of materials in the materials department, and I work on nanomaterials very small things, not, 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 not in the infrastructure space at all. But um, I'm also the Vice Dean for Research for Engineering at Imperial. And, and with, along with that role, I'm the, I'm the college champion for our strategic initiative around zero pollution, which um, Anna just gave a, a brief introduction to. Um, and in that space, we're really within the college just trying to think beyond carbon to take, to take a systems approach across, across how we see pollution. And, and that's not to say that we don't only worry about CO2, because obviously we're in an existential crisis <laughs> with climate change, but to, to take, I think, a broader view of uh, philosophically, how do we do things? How do we do engineering? How do we do science? What kind of future do we want to build? Right? Rather than just, we have to fix a problem, we want to create a different kind of future. And I think that challenges some of the things Daniel was saying about thinking about using nature, just rethinking everything that we do and the way that we do things. And so within that role, I'm, I really have to try and connect across the college from civil engineering, people that are doing more traditional civil engineering to people who worry about urban ecotoxicity, people who are thinking about energy systems and, and power transformations. And so it's, it's really a great joy actually to bring all those people together and start to see very different kinds of conversations and different ways of thinking about things. 
in, in really a holistic view. I guess with, with a material science hat on, I would say obviously there's an enormous materials challenge in, in a net zero infrastructure. I know Julian Allwood sets a very interesting thought experiment, which is that if, if we're still to use steel and cement, given their CO2 burden, and we're actually as a country committed to net zero legislatively, they really ought to be illegal in 10 years time. And what would you do if that happened? And, and I think as a, as a way of just making us realize the stark choices we're having to make, actually, in when we build things, when we reuse materials, I, it, it really is a time when we have to think differently about infrastructure. And, and some of those thought experiments are quite useful in this space. So I guess I would, I would just leave you thinking about where, where all the different bits fit together for, for a net zero infrastructure. Thinking about net zero pollution beyond carbon. And I think within that space to, to try and, I think we need to try and hold in our heads at the same time, a planet protection idea around, around the climate change and, and the environment, but also a resource protection. Because whenever you say pollution is okay and there's some threshold value we will get to, you're saying it's okay to disperse your resource into the environment. But of course, thermodynamically, that's the worst thing you can do if you want that resource at some other point. So if you simultaneously consider resource and planet protection, actually you should optimize both those things and end up in a better place. So is there a way we can do that going forwards for infrastructure? Thanks, Mary. I think you've, uh, you've given us a good provocation that I'm sure people uh, um, around the kind of virtual room, if you like, will be um, thinking about that and may maybe sort of thinking of their comments and questions that they can put into chat in a minute. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Nick Starkey. And um, Nick, uh, perhaps you could uh, give, give us your opening statement and uh, your thoughts on this. Yes, very happy to. Um, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's great to be with you this evening. Um, uh, my name is Nick Starkey. I'm Director of Policy at the Royal Academy of Engineering. I also look after our international programmes now at the Academy. Um, I have a, um, a government background, and before coming to the Academy, I worked in the Department for Business and before that, the Cabinet Office. It's a joy to be at the Academy, it's a marvellous place. And at the Academy is, as I think you know, the uh, UK's um, National Academy for Engineering. Um, and our strategy of the 2025 has two twin aims. Um, one of them is um, uh, sustainability, uh, the other is uh, inclusive economy. Um, the Academy also leads the National Engineering Policy Centre. Um, the Policy Centre brings together all 40 of the professional engineering institutes along with Engineering UK and Engineering Council to provide um, a single point at which government can access the enormous expertise across the engineering profession. Um, and we um, comment and give policy advice on the range of issues of national importance for public good. Um, and one of those programmes is uh, uh, precisely called the Systems Approach to Net Zero. We have launched uh, a launch paper earlier on in the year, which I commend to you, um, uh, recently a paper on uh, COVID-19 and the recovery from COVID-19 and how to do that in an environmentally sound way um, and have work coming on uh, con sustainable construction um, on low regrets, actually, um, uh, and on hydrogen um, and on power. And um, that's the, uh, the pipeline of work coming. We also engage governments in workshops on systems approaches and on uh, net zero um, and have produced private paper for the government where that's. Uh, alongside our work on net zero, we also have um, a, a range of other projects. We have a, a piece of work uh, on sustainable living places. I see Steve Yarney at the bottom of my screen who uh, helps us with that. Thank you, Steve. We have done a great deal of work on COVID-19, um, uh, supporting the government response to COVID-19 during the pandemic. Um, uh, and we have work on uh, infrastructure resilience, which you can find on our website, and a whole range of um, other issues too. But, uh, taking a systems approach to uh, uh, net zero um, has been a deep interest of the Academy uh, over a number of years, actually, um, and not just through this project. Communicating this to um, people who are not engineers, and I, I, I'm also in the North Engineer camp, um, but communicating this to uh, uh, non-engineers, particularly in government, is complicated, I think. I think people hear the word and they might think, um, well, this is just about you know, being joined up and taking everything into account. Or at the other extreme, they may think of the phenomenally complicated systems diagram that they uh, try to understand um, and were presented with before. Um, I have found that there are certain sort of guiding concepts in systems thinking which help you get in between the very, very general and the very, very complicated. 
that help people to understand how this approach might enable them to make better decisions. The concept of path dependence and how not to lock yourself into high carbon pathways accidentally, for instance. The concept, as Gordon was mentioning, of low or no regrets decisions and how to identify them, we could discuss that. Um, and of nested systems and of the way in which whatever system you're looking after is probably nested in a wider system, which, whether you've noticed it or not, is determining your options. And when we think of the city of London, there are things which are within London's control and there are things which uh, depend on how national policy is framed um, and how national and international systems work and being having a, a live sense of that will help we make uh, greater progress. Um, I'm looking forward to the debate and um, thank you for bringing me here. Great, so, so, so I think we should get straight into the discussion if we can. Mm -hmm. About we've we've talked a bit about carbon and we've talked a bit about um, net zero pollution in 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 in, in all of its guises and and um, Anna gave us this very helpful kind of framework of human activity emissions and footprints pollution and damage um, and I just wonder um, should we focus um, on carbon and try to sort that first or should we focus on pollution in all of its forms from the outset and I, I wonder I wonder um, perhaps perhaps uh, uh, what, what the panel feel about that Mary do you want can to I go can I go yeah. because I because I'm the one that said we need to think about everything I think there there's a danger that if you say we have to consider everything from now, you let, I think the expression is, you let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? And if we can't get perfect, we don't move forward. So I think we have to find ways to move forward because we have to deal with the climate crisis, all right? So I, I think it's okay to prioritize CO2, but I think it's really important that we do that in a way that doesn't deliver unintended consequences because we made a bad choice. And I think it's particularly critical for infrastructure because we're talking about a very long lifetime projects right we're not we're not saying we made a mistake with a car and then there's a next model right you're talking about things that the infrastructure projects that are lasting generations typically and so i think in that sense you really have to be cognizant of everything that you are putting into the system you have to think about the, the global issues and global supply chains you have to think about the impacts of the raw materials and, and the environmental impacts of those things and you have to just do a lot of i, I guess you the old fashioned word would be scenario planning, right? What, can, what are the potential consequences of all those different materials that you're using and the way that you're using them? So, so I think, yes, we should think about everything, but, um, but we should not let that hamper us. Um, just building on what Mary said, because I agree with everything she said, but I, I just think it depends on your audience. So um, we've got a real challenge in explaining to the general public what net zero is and helping them to understand what a low carbon heating system is. I think keep it as simple as possible for uh, the general public. Um, but yeah, don't, don't set aside the wider issues when we're um, looking at things from a systems approach. So it depends on your audience would be my answer. Yes, two brief thoughts. I mean, legally, I think the target is greenhouse gases. I think a systems approach will help reveal the trade-offs you're making on the way to that. So a systems approach should reveal the material resource um, uh, uh, consequences of the way you're pursuing batteries or um, uh, uh, PV, for instance, circular economy issues like end of life and waste, um, uh, biodiversity impacts. I am personally drawn to leading on carbon, however, because it's, it's comprehensible and people have an idea that they get it, maybe only at high level, we did a piece of work I referred to that Steve um, uh, worked with us on called Sustainable Living Places, where we looked at how you build sustainable housing and how you reconcile all the different interests that go into making a place, the planners, the developers, the existing residents, the new residents. And net zero turned out to be a sort of leverage point in the middle of that a concept that everybody knew they had to grapple with. And starting from there, you could start a conversation about how we're going to get from here to there. So um, I agree with the idea that you can bamboozle people. You definitely need to understand your trade-offs, but zero carbon is a good place to start. Okay, so I'm going to go first to Isabel and then to Daniel. Um... Thank you, Jennifer. And it's good to see you again. I think we worked together on the Audi Design Foundation projects. So I think my, my question is probably going to uh, Daniel in, in effect, because I'm picking up on his example, where potentially he did a project and got a 60% improvement effect on it. So I'm just wondering, was that the sort of what we might call 
the low hanging fruit, the easy things, or was it the effect of systems approach that found all these different things? And if he was then to tackle his next project, how much potential in, is there left in that one? Or is there diminish, diminishing returns? So come in on that straight away. Um, so the 60% reduction was actually over the entire capital program. Uh, so essentially it's everything that we build comparing to how we would have built it say five, 10 years ago with how we're building it today. And I say a lot of that is actually saying, do we need to build anything at all? And if we do need to build it, can we do it through some kind of nature-based approach, which minimizes carbon actually could be carbon positive because it sequesters carbon within wetlands, within trees and so forth. Um, and there is definitely diminishing marginal returns, but there's also significant potential to go further. We've, we've mentioned, so for example, low carbon concrete. So we've been testing various types of low carbon concrete. We've been testing modular construction, offsite construction, we're thinking about different ways, uh, you know, just simple things like different road surfacing, instead of just using tarmac, using ways which bind together the surface soil in ways which are much qu quicker to, to lay, but also provide you know, sufficient kind of ground uh, for our trucks, trucks to pass. Um, another really neat example uh, that we've just actually, well, been uh, in partnership with at the moment, uh, we're building two absolutely massive greenhouses next to water recycling centres, uh, one outside Norwich and one outside Bury St Edmunds, and it captures the waste heat from, a, from that water treatment process and pumps the heat into the greenhouses to heat them year round so that they can grow you know, far more tomatoes than they ever would be able to normally. And that the carbon footprint of those tomatoes is about 75% less than if you either grew them in the field or kind of ship them over from, from Spain. So it's a really neat circular economy solution. And the more that we look for those kinds of opportunities, the more they seem to present themselves. Great. So, so um, thanks, Isabel. Can we go to Daniel Vandenberg for his uh, question? Um, interestingly, I work for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Bays. I, I stress I'm here on a personal <laughs> basis tonight. Um, but is, I was really interested in also because I, 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 my PhD was in um, using novel techniques to remove water pollution from, from water um, and or one pollutant. And I was interested in the example about phytoremediation offered by Daniel and Anglian Water. So that's the, for people not familiar with the term, it's using plants to remove pollution from the environment. Um, my main question though is, I think more aimed at Anna and it's a bit philosophical. So the, wor the world is kind of got a lot of work to do towards net zero. But given we've had 200 odd years of humans putting particular warming particulates and a variety of gases into the environment over time. When the time is right, and maybe 2050 is the right time or the build up towards 2050 becoming real, do we need to shift to a net negative that we actually start to reduce the carbon we've added over hundreds of years? Or since the, the earth is a living ecosystem that slowly adapts, whether we like that adaption or not, as, a, as an entity trying to survive on it, would we actually do harm over time by trying to reverse what we've added historically? These are very philosophical questions. <laughs> I think I think there are two two points there. Um, I think the first one is that we still um, are not sure about the tipping point. So so people who do on the environmental management they talk a lot about the planetary boundaries and tipping points. So how much we can stress the natural system before some you know some huge event happens and everything goes to hell, uh, and and we are not sure yet. So we have. Um, some information about climate, so we have, you know, degrees of warming that are set as targets, but that's a global effect, so that, that's also something very important to mention, with things like air pollution, with things like water pollution, which are much more local effects, that thinking is, is really difficult, okay? That, that's one part, I think, of, of, of that uh, uh, question. I think another part is... Um, and I think something that was mentioned in the chat is around how ambitious we can be. Uh, do we go net zero, which is which is the isn't it? It's it's basically zero sum, or do we have to be even more kind of positive and, and improve the environment? So my, my thinking there is um, that we probably have to be a bit realistic, and uh, that huge change um, needs so many things to happen at the same time, including the change in the behavior, including the change of the policy, including the implementation of the technologies. Okay. And it, it, all of that will never go back to how the world was. And I don't think we should aiming for that. 
I think if we get to some balance of um, environment, not uh, giving us the signals that it's really stressed, as we see it now with climate change, with weather extremes and so on, I think that would be a good point. Um, and my final point here is around the speed of change. And I think we, we mentioned COVID at the beginning. And I think if I have learned one thing from all of this disastrous situation is how quickly things can change. And I think we should really, really think about that. I mean, of course, COVID is a huge global pandemic, but I think with the climate crisis, we are not far away from, from that. If there is a scare, uh, people react quickly, regulation comes in quickly, people adjust very quickly. I think we should learn from that and I think we shouldn't let go of that and implement that to think about how we solve the climate crisis as well. That's great. It's, 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 uh, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of the questions in the chat and I think they do follow on quite nicely from what you're talking about, Anna, um, because people are asking about you know, if human activities are the initiator, how do we start to change this? Um, and how do we persuade the public or the City of London enterprise that they have something to do now and what? You know, and I think I think, you know, I, I um, also in my in my, you know, in my life at home sort of wonder what should I do? Yeah, given given all of this um, this um, science, what can you do as an individual? And I wonder I wonder if um, if um, either of you could um, if, if anyone in the panel could could respond perhaps to those questions that um, Audrey and uh, Chris Price are kind of asking in the chat. I can tell you if you give just maybe a quick comment. Uh, I think this is the most difficult part of the change. Because, you know, as an individual, you think you have a small impact. So if I change everything, nothing will fundamentally change, okay? But if all of us change at the same time, then, then we have the big change. So uh, how we go about that, I think there's, there's maybe a missed opportunity around sharing the evidence and showing people, especially maybe, you know, some maybe catastrophic scenarios, because again, we, as humans, I think we need a good psychologist here. As humans, we, we react when we are scared. Uh, I think we're not scared enough yet about the, the climate crisis. And again, um, but I, I think equally, we should also focus on the things which we can do at the institutional and the policy level. I mean, why we are all wearing seat belts? Because at a certain point, the regulation was you need to wear them because you will be safer. There are lots of maybe things from the policy side that could try to influence the behavior um, at a large scale as well. Yeah, yeah, just to add, I, I think Anna's right, but I think also individual action, COVID has shown that, you know, everyone being locked down around the whole globe didn't have a very big impact really in the scheme of things on CO2 emissions, right? Not as much as we would have expected. And that kind of gives light to the fact that the individual action is driving it. But I think individual responsibility is somewhat different. And I think as citizens, we have a responsibility to, to make politicians listen when this is going on. And I think there's, you know, there's widespread acceptance now that people want some action on climate change, but, but individuals can't do it themselves, right? There has to be some policy initiatives to make, to make I think, this step change. Um, and so we should be lobbying for it, even if it's detrimental to us. The other thing I think just to, within that, and I think it behoves all of us to recognize that lots of people don't have an option to make certain choices, right? And, and you know, being, having, a, having, making a bad choice, but for a reason that you can't, you know, you, you don't have much control over. So understanding that different demographics have different agency in how they can make individual changes. And when we are actually talking about on the engineering side and the infrastructure side, that it, we create changes that are inclusive and that the whole every citizen can take advantage of it is really important. And I just put in the chat the Grantham Institute had a really nice piece on um, nine things you can do about climate change as an individual. It's a it's a nice read. And David, because uh, because uh, Mary's talking about what policy can do, may, maybe you could say a little bit about your role and and and, and what what, sure. what kinds of changes that yeah. Yeah. So um, I I really believe that policy will make the biggest difference. And that if we get the, you know, the right policy decisions and the right content, that that will drive uh, our journey to net zero more quickly than anything else. So the best example I can give you is the future home standard. So if we actually don't water that down and deliver it as an industry in 2025, it's bang on the, um, the pathway to net zero as defined by the Climate Change Committee. So that would take care of, of new build housing in the UK in one fell swoop. So 
you know, making sure that uh, we get the right policies in place and that as an industry, we prepare for those changes. And actually, that, that's not the hard bit. Um, once we've got a line of sight, then industry is pretty good at delivering the technology and the supply chains um, to comply with that regulation or that policy. Um, I know that that's not always how it seems and often industry will object and, uh, and, and look at the potential incremental costs that that might create for the supply chain. But, but actually, if government is really clear uh, that these things are required and goes ahead with the policies, industry catches up pretty quickly. And, and in my opinion, all of the technology that we need to comply uh, with net zero in the built environment is already there. I think a much bigger challenge is skills. And I think that's both quantity, quality, and um, lack of knowledge in certain uh, categories. Okay. So I think that's, the, that's a, for me, that's the rate limiting step, actually, not the technology. So I'm going to pick up on uh, Richard Loach's question in the chat, um, which is which is directly related to that. And then I'm going to come on to Chris, Chris Dent, who's sitting very nicely, quietly with his hand up. Um, and uh, um, Chris, um, Richard is asking a question about how educate, higher education can embrace these issues in educating engineers and others. And Mary, that seems like a question that you, you, you would be. Um, it well seems like it's a, it seems like it's a question for me. So I think when we thought about this and actually we've thought about how we can modify our curricula to, you know, to try and teach a broader range of skills. And, and there's always this balance between very discipline specific strengths that we know we need. You know, I don't want to take anything out of a mechanical engineer's undergraduate degree because I want them to build things properly. But, but give them, I guess, an appreciation for the, all the different disciplines that they need to consider. So I guess not making everyone a systems engineer, but giving everyone a systems lens. Right, so they should be able to say, I need to talk to policy and law and data and citizens and, you know, all of the different aspects. They need to understand what they are. And I think, and so what that means is you need to teach people who are able to communicate better across disciplines. You need to create engineers that are comfortable, I guess, outside of their comfort zone, right? So they need to understand that they need to, I guess, approach all of those different things and bring that together. And that's not, that's not easy. I guess, I guess more philosophically, I think we need to we need to give engineers more freedom to imagine, right? We tend to very, we tend to have very constraining and siloing approaches to education because we're trying to get so much technical information into them that they that they come out of their degrees thinking that they know everything and this is how it has to be done, right? So we we have to give them, I think, a freedom to imagine and and an obligation to question, right? So. Daniel gave some brilliant examples about not building, right? So they have to be free to say, well, actually, do we need to build this? Do we need to build it this way? And, and that's not trivial to do, but I think it's something we need to start working how to embed that in our, in our syllabus and, and then the training that we give to them. And I think that's the best thing we can do to change the future is give engineers an obligation to question. Yeah, it seemed like a really nice sound, sound bite, Mary, the kind of freedom to imagine, but the obligation to question. Yeah. Um, and um, so I'm going to come to Chris Dent, who's got his hand up. Yeah, so I think one of the panel referred to uh, possibly being the only non-engineer in the room. So I'm a chartered engineer who sits in a school of mathematics at, in, in a university. So I don't know quite what that counts as. Um, we've uh, question is that we've uh, we've heard um, in in quite a lot of the comments about working towards net zero, but I, I'd be interested in the panel's views on what uh, definition of net zero uh, we should be setting ourselves as a, as a nation. Because my understanding is that we've gone for the, the target of net zero, it's sometimes called net zero onshore or production basis, so you're not counting embedded uh, carbon in imports. And uh, one point, one important point about targets is that they also create incentives and the the concern is that um, uh, you, that in some cases, we by driving towards net zero, we could actually increase carbon uh, if we just not, if we offshore to uh, um, places where people don't do things as as, as clean. Um, and I've heard what I mean, what I've heard one uh, explanation of this that. Uh, um, under the Paris agreements, uh, this will go on someone else's carbon budget. We seem quite quite optimistic about how international geopolitics works. Uh, but I, I'd, be, I'd be grateful for the panel's views on this about what how, how we should in policy be uh, 
uh, be defining our our targets and uh, wh and uh, whether whether panelists share my concerns over the incentives that the present net zero target creates. Um, I would agree with your concern, Chris. Um, I don't know whether a um, better definition um, is um, uh, available, but um, a systems approach does have to consider the um, unintended consequences of chasing after um, a target. You need to have a target, but um, it would be possible to make progress towards our target by sort of deindustrializing and losing steel industry. Um, and it's not clear that that would actually benefit um, uh, the global atmosphere. Um, any more than it does. Um, I think policymakers are um, appraised of this, um, uh, but it does require um, a degree of broader perspective and a degree of discipline to um, approach the target in the right way. I mean, if I can just comment while other panel members are uh, gathering their thoughts, I mean, I'm always surprised that you know so much about your washing machine and kind of its kind of ratings on, on pieces. And sometimes we don't know those sorts of things when they go into buildings and infrastructure. And so I think we do have an information challenge sometimes in terms of getting that information through the supply chain. Um, David, has, has the Green Building Council been thinking about um, some of these questions? Well, yes. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question and um, I, I understand the concern, but I, I'm usually more in favour of getting on with the job and not worrying too much about the definition in the sense that uh, we've got to throw the kitchen sink at getting to net zero. There's so much we need to do that, um, you know, I, I do get the sense that we're fiddling while Rome burns if we, if we spend all our time trying to define net zero. So that, that's kind of my instinctive response. Um, let, let's actually start doing stuff and, and saving carbon today uh, and we'll define net zero down the line when it gets closer to the end of the journey. So I almost feel as though we're setting out from uh, London to Edinburgh and we're, we're worrying about the last mile and we've not even completed the first 10 miles. So that, that's kind of, if we want to get philosophical, that's my, um, my take on it. Let's, let's start doing stuff and save carbon today. Okay. So, so, so um, I mean, I guess there may be slightly different views around the panel uh, in, well, on this topic. I, th I mean, if I could just add in, I think philosophically, I think, and, and if you're taking a systems approach, you should really have the planet as your system, right? So you should think about carbon globally. And I think the, the idea of offshoring and carbon transfers and credits fundamentally undermines the principle. So, and I realize that's a very high ideal to live to, but I think that ought to be the aspirational point, right? That we are saying, when we say net zero carbon, we are taking net zero in the way we build things as having a net zero global footprint. And that's, I think, how we should define it. I know that's not trivial to do, but I think as a philosophical starting point, that's where I think we should be. Um, Daniel. Well, I just want to say that, yeah, um, I, th I think that the law is pretty clear in terms of what net zero means. The Committee on Climate Change's advice is absolutely clear in terms of what's required and the system of kind of carbon budgets being set every five years gives us a very clear trajectory to get there. Uh, it's also worth recognising that the CCC has an explicit obligation in the Act to consider the affordability impacts of the advice that they give plus also what it might mean for competitiveness of key industries, the energy intensive industries like steel and concrete and so forth. Uh, and once again, I think some of the concerns about carbon leakage haven't really uh, come to pass, um, partly, as response, uh, partly because policy has been brought in to make sure that doesn't take place. Um, but I think, you know, ideally, of course, we would think, is, think of the planet as a single system, think about how and which, uh, you know, carbon is potentially offshored through some of the choices we make domestically. But ultimately, we should be driving down our own emissions, if only as a leadership position when it comes to things like uh, things like COP26. I think it's also worth recognising in the Environment Bill, there is proposals to set similar long term legally binding targets for, for nature, for water, for waste and uh, resource efficiency, uh, as well as for air quality as well. So hopefully when the bill reaches raw ascent and targets, I think, are set in 2022, we'll then have a suite of environmental targets, legally binding targets in the same way as we have under the Climate Change Act, against which we will have to develop policy which achieves all those different objectives. And I think certainly in policy terms, we've detected a little bit uh, within DEFRA um, that they've been focusing too much on a single objective and potentially you know, dabbling in pollution swapping 
for example, it's a triple example, but they want to ban urea fertilizers, but that will just drive up greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, and it will probably lead to more uh, nutrient leaching into water quality, uh, into water, course, water courses. And that does mean that yeah, we focus, you know, going back to the point I think Nick was making earlier, you get a long way just by focusing on carbon, but that's not, let's not forget about potentially some of the perverse consequences of those choices we make. I'm going to take um, one or maybe two more questions, depending on how we go. Um, Richard, I know there's a lot of questions that you've been putting into chat. Okay, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think one of the things that infrastructure allows us all to do is it, it makes our lives better, but it also allows us to consume more. It makes it easy to consume. So maybe one of the things we need to discuss and look at in more detail is how much infrastructure we need. Do we need a bit less infrastructure at times, which help us consume less as well um, and help us think about our consumption. It's one thing to turn on a tap of water and have lovely clean water, which I love. I'm not uh, discouraging people, but if you have to go outside and pump the water yourself, you use a lot less of it, don't you? I mean, Anna, it sounds like that's a question for you and for, for Daniel, and it, it, given the example, maybe maybe you could uh, start us off. I, th I think it's, it's a very interesting question. I think it comes to lots of things we mentioned this evening, which um, if you still remember the, the, the sketch that I have shown you really tackles that first part. So it's the built environment and the human activities. I, I, I agree with David that we do, we do need to solve things. So we need to act, which is which is definitely true. But I think there is a value of stepping back and thinking about the, you know, what Mary was mentioning, the way of world we want to live in, and maybe, you know, I guess our children and our grandchildren, uh, and the way how we, I guess, you know, how our cities would look like, how we move around the cities, how we, where the resources are coming from. So it's really that thinking about uh, the pollution and the resources at the same time, and then seeing with the existing infrastructure, is that enough? Can we repurpose the infrastructure? There's a lot of discussion around lots of buildings. For example, people now work from home. There's lots of built space that is currently unused. Maybe we don't need to always build something. Maybe we can just repurpose the existing infrastructure and make the most of it. Maybe we can um, uh, have the better you know, service and or if you can integrate parts of the infrastructure and get them to work together better. So I really think there's so much option to improve current infrastructure systems before we start building. And in that re retrofit, we do implement new technologies. We didn't talk, for example, about the um, possibilities of uh, digitization and you know, using digital twins to control the system, all of data that we can operate the systems much better than, than, than maybe we are doing at the moment. And all that would have positive impact on, on pollution and resources. So I'm going to have to draw this conversation to a close because we're sort of running out of time and I need to hand us back to, to Gordon for some closing remarks. But I, I think it's it's really wet the appetite in a sense, right? I think we've really got started to um, started to unpack these issues around net zero infrastructure. And I certainly will be kind of um, going away with many thoughts and I'm sure we, will, we all will be. So thank you very much to the panel. Um, and I'm gonna hand us back to Gordon. Well, many, many thanks indeed, uh, Jennifer. That, wow, that was that was a brilliant discussion. Uh, we've heard, uh, uh, first of all, a wonderful introduction from Anna, and then uh, uh, inspirational comments from from the panel. Each each one uh, had had their points to, to be made. So it's been a t terrific evening, and let's not underestimate the 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 impact of, of thought leadership on on the approach and the potential solutions to, to these issues. It might even be that this evening in the room we've sparked a thought in a, in a young engineer or other professional, uh, David, doesn't have to be an engineer, and she will ultimately change the world by something that the, where the idea has been sparked here th this evening. And on the other hand, what's absolutely certain is if we don't have discussions like this and we don't start to imagine new and different ways of thinking about this wicked problem, uh, and if we take no action, then we'll definitely not contribute to its solution. But remember, too, that, that strategies need to be implemented. We mentioned a few times in, in the chat, and the, the time for talking is, of course, rapidly running out. 
and it is the time for action on, on climate change, measured action that we hope is the, the right action. That's part of the talent of engineers and others in collaboration to, to help politicians make the right policies. So we hope tonight might be another spur to action for, for all of us. Um, and the issue does need all, all disciplines, all the talents uh, to address it. Engineers definitely can't do it on their own. And as David mentioned, the impact of customers and, and uh, citizens and communities is absolutely fundamental. And marketers changing opinions and belief sets is, is, is part of the solution, I'm quite sure. And Mary's point too about inclusive change is, is absolutely vital. We've got, we've got enough divides already in our society, the economic divide, educational divide, the digital divide. We don't need another carbon remedy divide where the, the, the remedy cost is loaded unfairly on to those who really can't afford it. So whether it's been from a, a livery perspective, as as many here this evening are, or whether it's from a university research uh, perspective, as many of us here tonight are, or, or just a concerned citizen, we can and, and we really should be collaborating from a shared systems perspective, which has been the theme of the evening. We have recorded uh, the evening and we will upload an edited version of the video to the, the Worshipful Company of Engineers YouTube channel. Uh, accessible from, from our website, uh, where you can find out more about what we do as a, as a livery company as well. And if you're a chartered engineer, you can you can join us. But all of this tonight would, would never have happened without some really important people. The advanced publicity and the organisation of the event tonight has been a joint effort from UCRIC and Imperial Colleges, CSEI particularly, and the Worshipful Company of Engineers. So Tim Gordon, Jenny Jambona, Sandra Watts, thank you very much for your contribution. We also, of course, owe a huge debt of gratitude to our present, initial presenter, Anna, our four panel members chaired so ably by uh, Professor Jennifer White. Thank you, each and, each and every one of you. And I think probably, ladies and gentlemen, if you choose to, you may unmute yourselves to not just have a virtual round of applause, but maybe even a a really big collective round of applause mm. just to finish off the evening. <laughs> and, it, and it just remains from, from me, ladies and gentlemen, to thank all of you for attending. And I normally would say have a safe journey home, but I suspect that might not be very far at all for most of you here this evening. Uh, but thank you very much for participating. It's been terrific. And uh, watch this space for, for the, the follow-up as well.